Hey everybody, welcome back to the DevOps Lab. I'm Damien and I'm joined today by Marcel. Marcel, what are we talking about? So we're talking about zero downtime deployments on Azure Pass, mm -hmm. and I'm going to show you some demos, how we can do that on um, AKS, Azure Kubernetes Services. Awesome. It's pretty cool stuff. Don't miss it. Hi everyone, welcome back to the DevOps Lab. I'm Damien, I'm joined today by Marcel. Marcel, thanks for joining me. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. It's always yeah. a pleasure. Yeah, uh, we are at Kansas City Developer Conference at the moment, uh, far away from both of our homes. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but a really good event. Uh, the session you were talking about, or one of your sessions, is on zero downtime PaaS deployments, right? Yeah. Let's start at the beginning. What does PaaS mean? Yeah, so PaaS means for me um, anything but IS. So I do not want to manage the infrastructure myself. Okay. Uh, it's infrastructure in this particular case on Azure. Um, mm -hmm. So I want Microsoft to manage my stuff. I do not want to patch your machines. I just want to have an app platform, you might say, where I can host my applications. Yep. I do not want to worry about all the underlying infrastructure. Okay, so we're talking about web apps, Azure Functions, AKS even, Azure AKS, Kubernetes yeah. Service. Yeah, so I, my focus was on Azure Web Apps uh -huh. and uh, on Kubernetes. Kubernetes. Okay. Um, since uh, Azure Functions is really hot and new, but um, my experience is, has been at the moment at deploying web apps and web services okay. um, and uh, yeah, running on Kubernetes. So. Right. Okay. So zero downtime is the other big part of this, right? And that is you're updating your application, but you don't want it to have an outage period when people can't use it, right? Yeah. So that's the whole idea. You run a 24 7 operation, mm -hmm. uh, you want to. Um, get constant features to your end users, and you do not want to interrupt any of the services that you push to the customer. And uh, for me, it's not only about doing the updates in production so that my user is not interrupted, but also uh, more or less empowering your team to deploy anytime they want in the day. Because that's one of the big things with DevOps, you really want to be able to deploy any time of the day mm -hmm. without interrupting anybody. So that's the reason zero downtime is more for me from a team perspective, very important so that we can okay. just yeah build features and, and crank them out. Continually and, delivery. Continue deliver those deliver. Yeah, exactly. uh, the value to production, yeah. 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 Um, but as well as that, like if there's a bug or something like that, you don't want to have to wait until after business hours to be able to fix that bug. Right. You want to push that out. Yeah, you want to push it forward. So always roll forward instead of roll backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of the things that I talk about. I always say, well, roll back these days is for chickens. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. so uh, actually roll forward. If you have a pipeline that can deliver your changes like in minutes, um, yep. you're better off doing that. So this no downtime or zero downtime sounds like a hard thing to implement. Yeah. Does it require a lot of changes? Like, you hear zero downtime and somebody's like, oh, is that a checkbox in the portal? Can well, I, I only wish. Yeah. yeah, no. <laughs> but there's more involved. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, so it's very important to look at your application architecture to make it actually happen because we can leverage the infrastructure that's provided. So the past services do provide an infrastructure that enable me to do a zero downtime deployment. Okay. But that said, it also comes down to the application architecture because what actually happens behind the scenes, and it doesn't matter if you're using Kubernetes or if you're using uh, Azure Web Apps, um, you're more or less installing your software on another node and you're moving traffic to another node, meaning that you're not sharing anything between those instances of your application. Right. So if you would maintain state in the memory of your machine or your, your application environment or your app domain even if you're using the, the, the good old framework, yeah. um, that will die. It will, it will be gone. So if you have stuff like session state or something that you want to keep during that migration to a new instance of your application, yeah. you need to take care of that. So you either use a Redis cache or you use a database for that and then make sure that the data is in the database. Or even stored in the cookies that get sent back and forth to the, to the client all the time. Yep. And that way you can then maintain the state over the actual instance uh, that you would uh, land on uh, in your web farm or okay. your application. And we can get into some of the details when we have a look at, at what things you have to worry about. But what, why don't we have a look at um, like an yeah. example that yeah. you were running through in your session? Yeah, so, so one of my favorite examples is the good old Emphasis Music Store. Uh -huh. because, uh, the reason is that I want to show people that this can be done without the need to migrate to .NET Core, uh, run on Linux, or whatever. So right. uh, the demo that I have here uh, is the one that I use for KCDC. So hence it states here, welcome to ASP.NET MVC Music Store KCDC. Okay. Um, this is the one that I used on stage. 
And um, this is just a, an ordinary MVC application. So yep. this is .NET, uh, what is it, 4.7-ish, uh, somewhere there. Right. Uh, and that's what we want to deploy. Um, what I have also is I have a Kubernetes cluster running. Uh, okay. This is running on Azure. So if I would go to the Azure portal and go here to uh, my Kubernetes services, mm -hmm. you'll see that I have a cluster over here. And this cluster is a special cluster. And why is it special? Because it's not only Linux, it also has Windows. So this is now in preview. You can now move to Windows containers as well on uh, AKS. In the same cluster as the Linux one? Exactly the same cluster. So now we can do, uh, yeah, any type of application can now run in the cluster. That's great. Um, so if you go and look at my node pools, you see that I have two node pools, one that's running Linux. And you see that I've got four virtual machines behind the scenes here running in an Azure uh, skill set, mm -hmm. um, servicing me uh, the Windows nodes on the, on the cluster. Right. So if you see here in the portal, um, then you see that um, I have multiple nodes here. So you can see that I have uh, the Windows nodes. They are named Win0 uh, to, what is it, 4. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have an overview in the portal, then you can see that I already have a music store deployment running here. So that it is running. Um, and you see that I set the number of instances that I want to run, so that, that is the number of containers that are running on the cluster, mm -hmm. I set it to 10. Okay. And why do I set it to 10? Because it's a good demo. <laughs> <Right>. okay. <laughs> because yeah. now you can see when we're doing the upgrade that is going through the upgrade process and then creating new containers. Uh, and once they are healthy, then you see that it's um, yeah, terminating the healthy old ones yeah. so that I can slowly move to the new infrastructure that gets deployed. Okay. OK, Great. so um, what I want to do is I, I want to do a simple demo here. So uh, what I have here is uh, Visual Studio 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, this is just in my regular application. So let me show you that a little bit, because otherwise you might get lost. And so I have the Music Store web application. Mm -hmm. um, and what you normally see is that you have this notion of views. And in the views, I have a layout, chhtml. This is my basic layout right, okay. of my page. Yep. And what I will do is I will make a change here. So the KCDC thing uh, would be something like um, um, live uh, demo. OK? Yep. Um, I am uh, saving this. And then uh, what I will do is I will commit these changes to my uh, Git repository. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a, a, a live demo that I'm going to push. I'm going to commit that all. Since it's Git, it's still local. So I need to sync that, right? So now I'm syncing it to Azure DevOps, where I have my Git repo running. Yep. Uh, and when I click Sync, then my build will be kicked off. Okay. So. Yep. Um, the internet is a little bit uh, flaky here, so we need to uh, wait to actually push it. Uh -huh. uh, that's the, the bliss of conferences, right? Yeah, uh, that's right. It's that's always brilliant. 2,000 uh, people using the same Wi-Fi. Uh, yeah, it's always sense. tricky. Yeah. Um, but there you go. So now it's synchronized. So that's good. So now it's in the Git repo on the server side. And if I go back here, uh, you will see that I have uh, over here in Azure DevOps, um, a couple of pipelines. So I have a deployment pipeline. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I do is I build it twice, because I did a demo for the web apps, and I did a, de uh, a demo for Kubernetes. Oh, OK. Um, right. So I'm kicking off two builds. Uh, this is just a standard build, which you can then deploy to Azure Web Apps. And there, what I do is I create deployment slots and then move the traffic slowly to the other deployment slot. So yep. that's more or less uh, the way you can do that with, uh, with web apps. Um, the other thing that I have is here uh, a build. And this build, and I will show you the, the pipeline, how it looks like, um, is doing nothing more than say, OK, I'm going to build the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, and after I build the solution, I'm going to build the containers. Yep. And uh, once I build the containers, I can then push them to an Azure registry, where the container is kept uh, safely. Mm -hmm. So if you go here uh, in the Azure portal, you see that I have uh, a container registry. And that container registry is this registry over here, uh, where you will see that I have a repository. Okay. And that repository contains MVC Music Store. So that's where the containers will be pushed uh, to. Okay. So if I look here, then you see that I already had a couple of deployments done. Uh, so you yep. see a couple of uh, containers that were uh, part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, once my build is done, let me go back here to the pipelines. So once my build uh, is done, and yeah, it, it will take about a minute, minute and a half to bake the container and, and be done, mm -hmm. uh, what then can be done is say, OK, let me use a release pipeline. 
And what I've done for the release pipeline is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. um, at least I, I wanted to keep it as simple as possible, not too much uh, stuff around it. So yeah. if you look at the Kubernetes deployment, and I edit this uh, particular pipeline, you see I, I just push it to production. Don't be, uh, just be fearless <laughs> and uh, push sure. it to production this time. Um, but what you see here is that I got two actual tasks that I need to uh, execute. Okay. So I need to have a deployment description because Kubernetes works based on desired state configuration, right? So I need to define what is the state that I'm interested in, mm -hmm. how many new instances do I want to have running, and how would I like to do my upgrade scenario? So um, if I look at the definition of that file, and I have it here in my project, you see that I have the deploy music store over here. That is what we call a YAML file. And in this YAML file, you see that I say, okay, I want to have the 10 replicas. Yep. Um, I want uh, a strategy, which is a rolling update. Uh, you could also say replace. That means that uh, it will all tear the containers down, bring new ones up, so that you never have like two versions running at the same time. Right, okay. Okay, sometimes that's what you might need, but then you will have downtime. That's, yes. that's guaranteed, right? Okay. So a rolling update then tells me, okay, I want to gradually build, n add new container instances, mm -hmm. and then get rid of some of the others. Okay. And uh, what I've done here is I said, well, the maximum unavailable can be one. That means that I want to tear out one at a time. Mm -hmm. And the max search means that I can only have one more than 10. Because I set it I to be 10, okay. that's the number of replicas, and the surge is what can be the maximum uh, that you can add uh, to it. Now, okay. why did I do one? Because it's a good demo. Yes. Again. Yeah, because yeah. if I would do 10, it would just bring up 10 of them, be uh, done with the others, and throw them away. And there's nothing much that I can show. Now I can see that they're gradually yeah. Uh, yeah, moving you, these things around. But you might be comfortable with doing half of them at a time. Oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. It, it depends on the load that you need to take care of. Okay? Okay. Because yep. if you have a number of nodes, you need to know how busy they are. And based on that, you can then do some calculations and say, well, based on the traffic that we have now, I can say, well, either even add a new node to my cluster and take care of that so that I can then use that as extra capacity for a limited amount of time. Or, well, I can just add a, a couple and then move some of the traffic over. Right. And what I've done is, um, you see here my reference to the container that's being pushed to the container registry. Mm -hmm. And here you see that I have these build identifiers and I'm replacing that all the time. So every time that there's a new container available, I'm more or less replacing that token over okay. here. So this is what um, is actually being pushed uh, to the cluster. So if you're using Kubernetes, there's this command line, kub control, and mm -hmm. then kub control apply. I'm providing this file with the right identifier in there, and then the cluster will take care of it. So it picks up the, the right Absolutely. new version. Okay. Yeah. Now, the other thing that I've done is that, well, um, I want the, 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 the container to be ready to accept traffic. Mm -hmm. Because you might have uh, your application start. If you're using Entity Framework, it might take some time to actually um, yeah, get your entities warmed up, right? Yep, yep. Uh, fill some caches and other stuff. Uh, so that's the reason I created an extra page on my application, nothing more than an extra controller, uh, which I called health. Okay. Uh, and what will happen is, in this definition, you see that it will then uh, use this readiness probe to validate, oh, my new container comes up. I will probe it on that endpoint, so that will be health. Yep. I will do that after the first five seconds of wait. Okay. And then I um, am allowed to wait for 60 seconds for that to respond with a 200 okay. If it doesn't respond or gives a 500, yep. it will count as a failure. Okay. And I set the failure threshold to three, so if it fails three times, shoot the container through the head and try it again. Right. Okay. Because you might have deployed it on a node that's too busy or something else that's not yeah, actually uh, making the container run as we expect. Okay. okay. Is, it, um, and is this the readiness probe, is that part of um, Kubernetes as well or is this stuff that you've written on top? No. So um, Kubernetes itself will do the probing for you. Okay. The only thing is I need to do, and I can show you here with the controllers, the only thing that I did is a health controller that I added, which is nothing more than a standard HPNet page that I created. Okay. Because when you do .NET Core, you get these health endpoints and all the other stuff already if you're doing web APIs. Uh -huh. But this is just a web application. And the only thing that I need to do is either return 200 OK, so that I'm okay. good, or uh, return something else which is not 200. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what I've done is I just created a very simple page for this. So if I would um, have a look at the view over here, which is health, 
it is nothing more than listing that out on the screen. So this is nothing more than a table showing me all the genres that are in the database. Okay. But what I did is when you probe the health endpoint, I'm actually executing a query to the database. Uh, I'm getting the data back, so I'm validating that my whole uh, app is up and running. Oh, I see. Right, right. right. So, so that's legitimately more legitimately a health app. Yeah. 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 Um, so this is a very simple way of doing a health endpoint. You can do it fancy, and you can even return whole arrays with information and, uh, and other oh, stuff. Right. But this yeah. is like the easy way out. OK. OK, but uh, very, uh, very helpful. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it actually works pretty well. Um, so I have the health endpoint so that it can probe. Mm -hmm. um, so by the way, in the meanwhile, I expect that uh, my build has completed. So let us validate that um, for a while. So um, sorry, let me click the right button, and then it should be good. So go to pipelines. Mm -hmm. uh, you see that the containers demo is, is uh, ready. So uh, I can pick up uh, build uh, number three. OK. okay? Yep. So I can now go to my releases. And if I go to release, I can just say create a new release. OK. And um, uh, before I go there, just sh let me show you one more thing. So I, I showed you the token, right? Yes. So uh, yes. that's the one that I'm replacing here in this stage. So this is the replace token task that I'm using. And I'm just specifying that it needs to use my YAML file and then find anything with the markers underscore underscore. OK, so you're replacing that build ID. Exactly. Yeah. And then the only thing that I do is do uh, um, one of these tasks, kube control. Mm -hmm. uh, kube control apply. I'm specifying which cluster it needs to take. Mm -hmm. um, and what I've done is I am already um, created um, a service endpoint in Azure DevOps that knows how to connect to my cluster. OK. Yep. OK? Yep. So that's over here. I picked that one from the list. And then what I say is the command that I want to execute is apply. And I'm providing it then the name of my music store YAML file, which just has just the stop. replace token in there. Yep. Okay. Now, this has the strategy in there to do the rolling update. So um, now if I would go here, we would have a look at the cluster. Uh, it's now healthy. It's OK. So uh, let me refresh that to restate that that's OK. You can see here that my application is running. And by the way, you see here that I'm naming the machine what it's running on. So we can see if it, it, it's swapping between different instances. Okay. okay. So we can see that. Yep. Um, if you are running in a Kubernetes cluster, then this, na this identifier will be your replica set identifier. Okay? Okay. You will find that there. Sure. Okay? Um, so let me fire off uh, this release. So let's create a release here. Mm -hmm. um, it will pick up the latest one, which is 03. Click Create. And now I have my release that will be queued on one of the agents. Uh, this one I ran on a hosted uh, machine. So we have to wait a little bit for that to actually uh, pick up uh, an agent. And then the agent will take care of going through all the steps, right? So it will yep. download my artifacts, so it will replace the token, and then it will fire up uh, my um, cube control command. So this is the command that gets executed. Mm -hmm. Now in the meanwhile, let me go here. And when I refresh this, we will see uh, in just a couple of seconds uh, more, I think, then it will pick up the fact that we need to have a new deployment. And the, and the cluster will then go into the new desired state configuration, meaning I want all the pods to be replaced, all mm -hmm. the containers to be replaced um, by that new instance. And just one at a time. One at a time. Slowly right. wait till so they arrive. So right. now we see that we have what, two pods pending. We see that these are now the two new ones. You still, still see here the, the ones that are the old ones, 59B. So mm -hmm. 59B was the 59B over here. Yep. Um, and we see that it's created a new replica set with uh, 5FB. OK? OK. Um, so now what it will do is it will start up the container, and then it will start probing. And we'll start hitting the health endpoint. And mm -hmm. then uh, we can see if that's actually um, working all right. And while that's working, that website is still completely accessible. Yes. That's yeah. So I can just browse this one uh, constantly. Um, there's nothing changing at the moment yet. You still see that it's uh, uh, KCDC here. So I'm still hitting some of the old parts that are in there. Mm -hmm. um, and in the meanwhile, it's it's um, yeah creating the new ones. So let me refresh this again, and then we will see probably that well, um, we now have up, but only the five. Yeah. Five FBs over here, five nines over here. So it's actually now 100%. And then if I refresh this, you will see some of the yellow again because it's still uh, working on this new deployment over here. And you see that it now took uh, some additional ones that it's now trying to uh, create. 
right. and, and monitor. And you can see, by the way, the old replica sets as well. If something fails here, I can say, okay, roll back to the old replica set, and then um, I can retry it again. Yep. Uh, because I knew that the old parts were still working, it was all okay, so. Um, and it will do that the same way? It'll roll, it'll roll I need to issue a command for that. So I need to do a kip control and then uh, uh, issue the fact that I want to roll back to the other replica okay. set. Yep. Yeah. But then that will still be no downtime, zero downtime. No, well. because uh, it, it more or less does the same thing again. Just with an older yes, version of yes, the Yes, that's yeah. the great thing about this. Um, so now you see it's 5FB and you see live demo. So this is now the update that we took place. Mm -hmm. um, and what I've done is I also added telemetry to this. Because um, one of the things that is nice uh, about uh, moving this stuff to production, and let me show you the live metrics here, mm -hmm is that uh, we can monitor constantly if our application is doing okay, right? Because when you're deploying something to production, it might that you just deployed new software, but um, it was not that good. Right, yeah. And you want to monitor that. And um, Azure DevOps supports the notion of gate, so I could do a multi-gate deployment and then say, well, uh, that wasn't a good idea. I want to wait on some of the monitoring information and then either go to the next stage, yes or no. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm using App, uh, App Insights for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see here now that it's constantly probing my health endpoint because that's what Kubernetes is doing because I'm not generating traffic at the moment. Yeah. Um, and what you normally do is that you say, well, deploy my new application but hide everything that I have new behind okay. the feature flag. Right. And why would you do that? Because then you can compare, okay, my old deployment and my new deployment based on telemetry show me that the system is still exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And then what you can do, and that's why I have the feature toggles over here. Um, I now created something with feature toggles over here where I can then say, well, um, and the hypothesis here is that uh, my marketing app, uh, department says, well, it's, it's better to welcome people from where they are in the world based on their IP address, do some calculation on that, and then show, well, welcome from some location. Yep. Um, and then you can go into deployment strategies. You can say, okay, do I want my user to see it right away? Mm -hmm. and, or do I want to do what we call a dark launch? And a dark launch is where we say, well, I'm not showing it the UI yet, but I'm feeding the data already in my application so I can see that, for example, my server CPU cycles go up or my memory uses goes uh, in the, the wrong direction. Yeah. And that's the way we then uh, look at that. I can then uh, first toggle on the back end, uh, then toggle on the front end, so the UI part of that, uh, if I actually am confident that my deployment was successful. Right. So that's more or less the way you can run through this. And uh, I find Kubernetes very helpful in this because it takes care of all the traffic management and all the other stuff. While when you're using app services, then you still need to do the traffic management yourself and you need to move the traffic to the other slots that are in there. Right. But that's, that's basically uh, what I showed during my session and uh, yeah, what we're using in production uh, ourselves with our customers. Awesome. So, yeah. And when we, uh, so when we publish this, we'll put some, sh uh, some links in the show notes sure. as well to some more information. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and I've got a Pluralsight course on this stuff as well. So oh, that's handy. That's pretty handy. So if you want so more video. Absolutely. Yeah, I can put some links in there um, yep. uh, all about feature toggles uh, and those kind of things. And of course, uh, the Azure DevOps pipelines, how you can use them and how you can make this all happen. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for showing us that. Well, thank um, you. Thank yeah. you for inviting me. And hopefully this is something that you can start using in your own situations, in your own applications. Well, yeah, definitely do so. Because it's, it's not that hard. It's just uh, getting, getting in there and do it the first time. That's the scary part. But after that, you, you will feel confident about it. And the advantage is a pretty big. Absolutely. Pretty high. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much, man. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And um, stay tuned for another DevOps Lab soon.